Good morning all. The time is 11.59 on Tuesday the 17th of March. Just got up before morning. <laughs> I've slept pretty good. It's always difficult to get back to sleep when you, you know, work a late shift. Um, but it was alright, all things considered. I never sleep quite as well. But no one ever does if you're not in your own bed, do you? But I'm sure this place will feel more than home very soon. I'm just going to go have a quick chat to Sonia, uh, my new lad lady and one of the consultant anaesthetists at the hospital. So someone is going to be under huge pressure. We're going to expect in the kind of numbers we're going to see that are going to need intensive care. Later on as well, I need to go to the shop and get a razor because I need to have a shave. You'll find out why later. And um, also be interesting to see what the kind of what's happening at the shops. <laughs> is there going to be any toilet roll left? Those people panic buying? You idiots. And then I've got a shift later on today. So um, I'll let you know how things are going there. So that's what's in planned for vlog number two of things on the ground from a junior doctor's point of view in the UK. My hey. new housemate. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for having me stay. That's okay, you're very welcome. Man. Welcome to the Corona House. <laughs> Is this the Corona HQ in yeah. terms of our lives? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I think we're going to get busy with some more visitors, <sighs> residents. Oh really? Yeah. Do you think more people will come? I on? think more people will come stay. They want to be close to the hospital. Commuting long distances at a time like this isn't going to work well. Oh, I really appreciate that. Anyway, very kind of you. But I was chatting to some of my colleagues who were uh, with their folks or had partners who were uh, underlying health conditions yeah. and that's a real worry for people. Yeah, I think the problem is that most people are going to get this, you know, predictions are maybe 60 to 80 percent of the population and the important thing is that the vast majority of them are going to be fine. Over 85 percent don't even know, need to go to hospital. Mm. We're already seeing people that test positive who don't even know they've got it. Right. right. So that's great. But there are at-risk people who mm. need to be protected and the protection isn't so much about stopping them from getting it, it's about staggering when people get it so that the hospitals can cope. When people are coming into hospital, because obviously I've, I've said before on the channel that when people come in we can do, give supportive care like oxygen and fluids, but ultimately we're really monitoring them in case they need someone like you, right? Yeah. If they need ventilation and yeah. things like that. Um, the, the word coming out of Italy is the vast majority of, of patients settle with some extra oxygen mm. and some monitoring. Probably about 9 out of 10 mm. uh, then will then settle. But unfortunately that means 1 out of 10 people that come into hospital with this are going to need intensive care mm. and are going to need to have their breathing supported with a ventilator for a period of time. Mm. And obviously we're starting to see people you know, across the country needing that kind of support. And I guess right now though, it's not so much physically ventilating people, I know we are seeing that, but it's about ramping up so we can support yeah. more. Yeah. yeah, intensive care is a very specialist area. It has a lot of specialist in expensive equipment, um, but it also has very specialist staff. And you can't mm. magic the staff out of thin air. <laughs> so uh, it's not really about how many ventilators you have, it's about how many staff you have mm. trained to uh, use those ventilators. So uh, a lot of the hospitals are taking a very pragmatic approach and starting to bring in really urgent training for different staff groups that can support intensive care. Uh, the main group being the anaesthetic department, mm. the theatre nurses and the recovery nurses. They can swell our staffing base up by a huge number, which will allow us to take more patients. Mm. Okay, so I guess we'll see things like electives cancelled to support yes. that. Yes, mm. uh, at the moment I think there's a pragmatic approach to try and get people who need time sensitive surgery, so that's things like cancer that might spread without mm. early surgery, um, to try and get those cases through quickly before we see the peak of this, so that those cases can get done, mm. and then the cases which are less time sensitive, in reality, are going to have to wait a couple of months while this calms down. Just outside of all this going on, how are you feeling? I mean, it feels yeah. like the whole world's gone mad, but before, I know that when I started first hearing about the coronavirus, I was certainly a bit more, I just, you always hear about these things and they never seem to 
come here. And I, I don't mean to take anything away from the issues that people have been having in other countries. It just feels very real for me. I'm not necessarily seeing it, but I see the change in people's attitude yesterday at work. Yeah, and yeah. How are you feeling personally about everything? I think this is potentially a very scary situation. We are in uncharted territory. This is not anything that we've ever experienced in our lifespans. Uh, and it will stretch us beyond belief. However, the view that I take on this is I've spent 20 years learning to be an intensive care consultant and a senior intensive care consultant. And I guess this is what I've spent those years learning for. Mm. This, is, this is the crisis that I have spent my life training for. Mm. And as such, I have no doubt that myself, my colleagues will rise to the challenge. Mm. And we are so lucky that we have a publicly funded health service mm. that's accessible to everyone. That gives me a lot of reassurance. I think it must be very scary to be in a country where you have limited access to healthcare. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it's scary times, but I think we've got the heads up. We're ahead of the position China was in and maybe even Italy. We know mm. this is going to happen and we've got the ability to prepare. Mm. I know we've got to prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. You know. Life goes on. Yeah. Uh, Super. All right. And we'll probably check in with you as things go. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Super. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sonia. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> it was pretty inspiring chatting to Sonia. He's some pretty amazing people that work in the NHS. I mean, I would say that she is you know the intensivists are super specialized and they they would be very well trained to handle this personally you know as a junior we have very general medical training but i don't feel personally that i'm trained specifically to deal with something like this but i'm sure as things progress my training will increase and my knowledge and experience will increase as well so slightly more nervous than uh, then she is. I guess we're all worried about the kind of worst case scenario, aren't we? Anyway, so I'm off to the shops now to see how apocalyptic the panic buying is. <laughs> um, as I say, I need to get a nice shave done. And uh, also, Sonia wants some Maltesers, so hopefully no one's panic buyed the Maltesers. If you have, you're in trouble. You think with a shop this big, they're bound to have enough for everyone. And also guys, I'm proper on brand. Got my YouTube bag for all the shopping. No Nurofen or paracetamol. Great. Okay, if you want gravy and vinegar, you're all right. If you want pasta. <laughs> no pasta for anyone. That's the bread aisle. Yes. Get in. Got them all teasers, so <laughs> at least the landlady's happy. There's no shower gel. So, <laughs> so everyone in the NHS is gonna smell pretty bad. So um, I have to get used bath stuff instead. So muscle therapy or sleep. I think let's keep it muscle. Don't want to be asleep on the job. The shopping is done. I took videos of a lot of where I saw empty shelves and stuff, but there was still loads of stuff there. It's just certain products people have been stupid enough to panic buy. <laughs> Having said that, did I accidentally panic buy uh, two boxes of Maltesers? Maybe I'm a guilty party. But managed to get shaving stuff. So that's next on the agenda. Day two of the vlog and found another parking space, so not bad. I've got this really itchy face that I can't help almost touching. But anyway, ready for, ready for another shift in the emergency department. Um, I think it'll be much the same as yesterday, actually. I'm nice, clean shaven, almost touched my face again there. Absolutely gorgeous day, look at this. Perfect time to be locked <laughs> in a hospital. Hello, Ed. Hello. So, so we're just going to taste test you right. to see if we can then fit mask test you. Okay, cool. Okay. Why, is it, why is it called the fit mask? Is it because I'm to test if I'm fit or not? Uh, yeah, exactly. I think you might fail on this one. <laughs> 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 
Right, just tell us when you start to taste it, all right? Okay. It tastes like, yeah, it tastes really... Undersell, like, undersell paracetamol. It does. It's medicinal taste. I it? think it tastes like when you were a child and your mum used to say, don't lick money, it's dirty. You think, right, oh, I'm going to lick it now. It does. It tastes like a pound coin. It does. <laughs> you reckon my face might be too small? You have a tiny little face. You good? I'm trying my face up. I'm trying to... I told you it was a pit test. I failed the pit test because my face is too small. Okay. So we're up to... Almost up to two minutes. Yeah, we've only got five more to go. <laughs> How long does it take? Seven, Seven minutes. minutes. Seven minutes. Right, now you need to be turning your head from side to side, side continually, side. please. Oh, you need to shave a bit closer. What? This. You've got a bit of stubble coming through there. It'll be alright. I shaved today. <laughs> <laughs> Not... So the next squirt that um, Freya's going to use, you're going to be an exaggerated nod. Okay, got it. Alright. In exaggerated in terms of speed or in terms of <laughs> No, speed? not fast, just an exaggerated movement. So this is all testing the that the, the mask fit fits the mask. you, yeah. You can't taste anything yet? No. Well done. What about your take on COVID nineteen then? What do you think? What's your conspiracy theory? You don't need to oh, while you do okay, this. fine. Um, well, a lot of the conspiracy theories are about China, isn't it? Really well, it's about China. Aliens. I've been told today. What? Together and bow, and you keep doing so. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. 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 I know. I love the way I automatically put my hands together. Can you taste anything? No. I'm surprised because I, I thought your face would be too small. No. It's got a so, very manly face. So don't be, don't be slagging off the face before you actually know. So you wear this when you're dealing with a very high risk, high risk. or a known COVID patient. And what are these masks called? FFP38833. You have passed. passed. I am officially fit. Now take it off in there so you can show everybody what it tastes like. You might not taste it. Oh God. <laughs> Pear drop time. <laughs> Whoa, that tastes like, that is, oh, that tastes horrendous. And it's like being at the doctors when In they give head. you an injection and they give you, and are these great. actually, are they your idea or they're the actual it's idea? idea. I think mm. it's my, but it was worth it just for that. I thought, I thought. Halfway through the shift and it's been a fairly normal good day. Yes, we're seeing suspected COVID-19 cases. Um, I'm not gonna sort of go into numbers because they're all kind of unconfirmed. As I said yesterday, one of the difficulties is just shortness of breath and respiratory illness is a common presentation to A&E. And so we won't always know when someone comes in what they have. They could just be like an infective exacerbation of COPD or kind of, uh, you know, a bacterial pneumonia. They're the common things we'd see, you know, outside of this crisis. Um, so we have to really treat everyone like that as a kind of risk for COVID-19. And we won't know until we send the swabs off and they take a, a couple of days to come back. The history, the blood test and the chest X-ray can all hint at it, but you can never know for sure. So people coming in with suspected COVID-19 that are clinically well, we are sending them home without a swab. So it's only patients that come into hospital um, do we swab at the moment. The old mask fitting was a bit of a funny saga earlier, wasn't it? They allowed me to keep the mask. You can't use it again. They're kind of single use. You realise we're going to go through an awful lot of these. I think um, in the just the normal kind of surgical masks, not these, we went through I think nine boxes yesterday just in one day, which is a crazy amount. Obviously I can't, I don't know how many is in a box, so <laughs> You won't be able to quantify that. It just shows we're going to need a load of all types of equipment. You hear so much about ventilators, and I know you obviously need the staff of the ventilators as well, but all the other things we're going to need a lot more of, you know, potentially masks, oxygen. But overall, it's business as usual, and it's no surprise that in medicine we have a bit of a sense of humour with it. It doesn't take anything away from how bad things could potentially be or how bad they're anywhere else. It's just, I guess, a coping strategy. You can't have your head down in the dumps all the time. So the, the mood has been fairly buoyant. People are obviously anxious, but it's not stopping people doing their job. And actually some of the camaraderie is, is as strong as ever, really. Should we get stuff where things start getting stretched, then 
you know that that spirit is really what we're what we're going to need in abundance so have a bite to eat and then we'll wrap up this shift with a few more hours there you go so evening partnership done and i wouldn't have noticed any difference really it was actually a really enjoyable shift i mean there are some things changing, more gloves, more gowns, more masks, and a noticeable more amount of hand washing, not just from the staff, but also the patients as well and their relatives. So people, again, the awareness is up there. And again, the general chat about, you know, where things are gonna go. I got stitched up earlier by one of the nurses. So a patient I saw said that she recognized me from YouTube and I was went all red and embarrassed, but then I found out the nurse actually told uh, told the patient to say that to me. A proper stitched up. So in the next vlog, I'm gonna look at the clinical presentation of COVID-19. So we all know about the main symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath, or there are other minor symptoms as well. But I'm gonna talk about the clinical presentation that we'll see in the emergency department. So the chest X-ray, the blood results, the observations, that type of thing. The take home message in this episode is, we don't know what's gonna happen in this crisis, in this pandemic but you can control how you react to it. And we've seen two types of people. So we've seen people like Sonia and other healthcare workers that are ready you know, to step up and try and make a difference. And we had other people, people panic buying and just being selfish and out to their own means. We don't know what's gonna happen, but you have a choice of which person you're gonna be in that scenario. So which are you gonna be?